This is the third in the series of week one topic videos for ERC 425 625 about the anthrosphere. Now, as you've read in the text, the anthrosphere is that part of the environment that is made or modified by humans for use in human activities. It's a little bit more conceptual than some of the other spheres. For instance, the atmosphere, which is a definable physical place, or the hydrosphere. The anthrosphere could be a definable physical place. Think about the classroom that we meet in for this course. That's an entirely constructed environment that is physically made of man-made materials as well as a gaseous envelope. So there's an intersection with um, the atmosphere. And when we as humans are in that room, we are an intersection of the biosphere with the anthrosphere. But you can also imagine a kind of a more gray or diffuse zone in the anthrosphere, such as some of the things depicted in this diagram shown here, which shows the kind of interface between human activities, human infrastructure, and the natural environment. So think about every painted surface that we expose to the atmosphere to exchange chemicals with either the gaseous envelope or with through flowing water during rainstorms. Think about the land masses near freeways. We've got material transferring from vehicles, coming off the tires, coming off the brakes, chips of paint, stuff eroding off the roadway. Most of that stuff is transported and deposited very close to the roadway, but not on it itself. And so that kind of interface zone between the road and the neighborhood the road goes through is also in some ways a part of the anthrosphere as are areas under and adjacent to runways at airports. Um, think about uh, areas in harbors. For instance, when we dredge a harbor to deepen it, uh, we recover materials that often include the legacy chemicals of human activities. Imagine radionuclide contamination that's been released to the atmosphere in gaseous form and then deposits on the landscape in large crises like Chernobyl. These materials can be deposited hundreds of kilometers away from the source of the accident. So in that case, and for that incident, the anthrosphere extends quite far from the location where the uh, material was input into the environment. In other cases, the anthrosphere may only extend a few tens of meters away. Think about indoor air pollutants inside of buildings, all the various volatile organic carbon compounds that are coming out of um, you know, the carpets and the seat cushions that we sit on. You go into a restaurant, there are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons being produced during the flame broiling of your hamburger. Um, think about now you're, you're uh, in a garden somewhere, you're looking at the topsoil. Maybe that topsoil has been fertilized in some countries and in some places. This can be done with sewage or sludge or waste that can contains besides essential organic constituents chemicals uh, of a legacy fashion that are considered contaminants or even pollutants that are not necessarily good uh, for that setting. Think about a landfill, an area we isolate from the environment and we put our rubbish and um, with the idea that it's going to stay self-contained there, but there are chemical transformations that happen, interactions with the water table, the migration and leaching of chemicals, and so the uh, area in the subsurface surrounding the landfill may become contaminated and therefore also become part of the anthrosphere. So, you know, it's just important to remember that this is a concept and we're basically using the anthrosphere. We can think of it as a reservoir. We can think of it as a thing receiving and giving exchanges with the other spheres of the environment, but it does operate a little bit differently. And so our goal in environmental science is to describe the flux of pollutants and or toxic substances across the interfaces between the anthrosphere and other spheres. And obviously with the goal of minimizing the fluxes and maintaining a functional technological society. Another related concept is something called the Anthropocene. Most of you, or maybe all of you, are aware that the geological time scale is divided up into various eras and epochs. And these are recognized by different types of rock formations, oftentimes separated from one another by major events, changes in the type of flora and fauna seen on the Earth, changes in the environmental conditions, hot or cold, for instance, on the Earth. 
these oftentimes represent very rapid transitions. Now some people have hypothesized that the extent of our impacts of um, technology have put us into a brand new geological era that for instance geologists 10,000 or 50,000 years from now will be able to identify as a separate layer by things like microplastics and garbage and heavy metal concentrations that are abnormally high and very great species extinction rate um, and this has been called the Anthropocene it is a concept and it's not universally accepted. I happen to subscribe to the notion of it, um, but others who are more uh, purist about the definition of the geological time scale um, are less likely to um, use this terminology. It does um, reflect the cumulative ecological uh, attributes of the planet, climate, environment, um, much like other periods of time in the geologic uh, record that we do give names to, which is why I consider it to be a valid construct. Okay, I've shown you this diagram before, but I just want to remind you of where the anthosphere sits um, in terms of fluxes and other reservoirs. And I just want you to think a little bit about what do we really mean in a particular example. So this is a picture of a vehicle. Obviously everything about that vehicle screams uh, anthosphere. A human sitting inside of it would be a human interacting with the atmosphere, uh, with the anthosphere, excuse me. Um, and you can see that that vehicle is sitting on the ground and it's sitting in the atmosphere. And I've drawn some arrows on there to represent the potential fluxes that go between the vehicle and the atmosphere or the vehicle and the um, uh, uh, geosphere. So for instance, there's a, yeah, I ask you the question of, you know, what do you think they could be? I'll just throw out some ideas. For instance, the yellow arrow going from the atmosphere into the car, that could be oxygen from the atmosphere being used to burn uh, fossil fuel in the engine. You can also see uh, an arrow going from the ground into the car. That would represent the extraction of fossil fuel itself and its refinement to put into the vehicle. You can see an arrow coming out the back of the vehicle into the atmosphere. That would be automobile exhaust and its various chemical compounds. And you can also see a flux arrow coming from the vehicle down into the geosphere. That might be, for instance, spilled oil or other fluids that leak into the soil and ground. And there are other ones, obviously. But one of the things, goals, is um, you know to have efficient modern transportation that minimizes these fluxes. Now, finally, I w just want to bring up the idea of industrial ecology, which has made a, a major transformation over the last sort of half a century to maybe a little bit more in the sort of post-World War II um, era, where coming into that from the start of the Industrial Revolution into World War II, there was this idea of a sort of a one-way pathway where factories represented by that kind of stack of bricks with a smokestack coming out of it, um, would take raw materials from the environment, refine them, make stuff, whatever that stuff was, you know, a can of Coke or a washing machine or what have you, and um, produce the product as well as some emissions. And those emissions could go into the atmosphere or they could be solid or liquid emissions as wastes. And as I say, until recently, these waste streams were just produced and energy was wasted in the process and they would just go into the environment. We've subsequently realized that not only are we fouling our environment, but we're putting potentially important raw materials that could be used by other industrial processes back out into the environment rather than saving them. And it turns out that many of these fluxes from these human processes from the anthosphere back into the environment have lots of unpredictable uh, consequences, many of them much more extreme than we ever anticipated, acid rain being a great example. So the technology to halt these fluxes has improved significantly over the past decades, and that's the sort of first step in developing an industrial ecology. But to become truly sustainable, we want to go the next level, which is not just to minimize those fluxes, but to minimize the utilization of energy as well, and to conserve materials so that we have to take less new raw materials out of the earth and expend energy in so doing. 
So this is a kind of a sequence of events that shows you how um, we've migrated from kind of starting with um, this uh, single directional extraction method to a system where we employ remediation, which is cleaning up of our waste streams, not necessarily reusing the materials, but at least cleaning them. Things like scrubbers on smokestacks and ways of accumulating uh, fluid and solid waste and scrubbing out some of those chemicals, concentrating them, for instance. But what an even better way to run an industrial ecosystem is to hold and reuse materials. So for instance, placing multiple factories next to each other where the waste stream of one factory may be the feedstock of another so that there's efficiency in transportation and in material utilization so that in a net sense, we put much less material back out into the environment. And this is the concept of an industrial ecosystem. It's discussed in the textbook. We'll talk about it a little bit more throughout the semester as we look at individual environments and contamination issues and individual mechanisms for remediation.